Good morning. It's great to be back here with you. I, I sure enjoyed my previous time that I was here and was able to speak with you and spend some time and worship with you. And uh, today has been no different. The classes are great and, and the fellowship is amazing. I'm, I'm just always pleasured to be here with you guys in Columbus and, and worship with you. I've got, got a little bit that I want us to talk about this morning. And I want us to start by thinking about reading through the Bible in a year. That's a very popular thing that people like to do. It's very popular for somebody to try to synchronize their daily Bible reading with the days of the year and start at the beginning of the Bible on January 1 and try to read through the entire Bible by December 31st. It's a very popular thing to do. But one of the caveats of that is this. Around this time of year, if you're reading through the Bible sequentially or even chronologically, around this time of year you're either just getting into or you're just getting out of, or you're right in the middle, one of the most difficult sections of Scripture to read through. And everyone probably knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Levitical law. For us to synchronize our daily Bible reading with this, sometimes it can be difficult for us. And sometimes, and I would venture to say most of the time when somebody starts to falter in their daily Bible reading throughout the year, it probably has something to do with this section of God's Word. Because it's difficult for us to read through, right? It's difficult for us to see. One of the things that I've seen kind of in in my own study is it's helpful for us if when we're reading through this, we kind of keep a grand, large idea of what we're reading in our minds. Kind of keep a high-level overview of what we're reading in our minds as we go through it. So as we're reading through the Levitical law, it's amazing to see all the requirements that God had of His people during this time. Amen. It's amazing to see everything that they not only had to do and say, but everything that they had to be during this time in God's Old Testament and Old Covenant. The Israelites had laws governing every single aspect of their lives. We touched on a little bit in class this morning. The tabernacle had to be built to precise and exact specifications, dimensions, the material that went into it how the material and the things were treated inside the tabernacle. Everything about the tabernacle had laws covering it. There were laws about relationships with other people. There were laws about the Israelites' relationships with other nations throughout the world. There were laws about the Israelites and their relationships with their own family members. There were laws covering everything. Laws about sickness. How every illness was to be treated. Laws about celebrations. Laws about sacrifices. Laws about certain days of the year. There were laws covering every single aspect of their life under this old covenant. Amen. Now, I, you know, I don't know for sure because I haven't met everybody here and I don't know your background, so I don't know if anybody has ever spent any time living outside of the United States. I don't know that. I, I haven't. I can, I can tell you that right now. I've spent my entire life living in the United States. But having that said, living in this country, which is one of the most free and one of the most full of liberty nations that has ever been on this earth, I I can't even really wrap my head around this. Everything that that was required of them. I can't even really imagine what it would be like to have a law governing every step of my day and having a certain way that I was supposed to do everything. I can't even really wrap my head around that. As opposed to the old law, that old covenant that we're talking about, we now live under the new law. Amen. The new covenant is much different, isn't it? There's a lot of things about that old law that really aren't true under this new covenant. We live in a very, very different age and under a different promise from our Lord. Under this New Testament, we no longer have a certain nation, a certain group of people, as it were, an earthly group of people, on this earth that is God's chosen people. We no longer have a tabernacle or a temple in the physical sense of the word. We no longer have to offer sacrifices. We no longer have to have certain celebrations on certain days of the year. The attention of the old law and the old covenant is really more about what the person was doing and the things that that was required of them and the things that they had to take part in. And if you, if you kind of think about it a little bit, the, the focus and the attention of the new law 
And the new covenant is not really on what you do. It's not on what you say. It's not on where you are and this and that. It's really on what you are. Whereas the old law and the old covenant focused on the outside, what you were doing, and what other people could see you doing, the new covenant and the new law is focused in here. And if we get this right, the outside seems to take care of itself, right? The new law is very different. We're required simply to live a life that's worthy of being called a Christian, worthy of being called a child and a servant of God. We're required to live a life to follow His plan of salvation, to worship as He commands us to, and to spread His gospel. And really, when you get down to it, that's all that's asked of us. That's all we have to do to be acceptable in God's eyes under this new covenant. Comparatively, if we write all this down and we look at it on paper, we've got a whole lot less asked of us today. We've got a lot less asked of us today than the Israelites did when you write it down on paper and you think about it physically. We can have greater rewards as well. So if you look at the requirements of the old law and the new law, we kind of get the benefit of that because we have less required of us. But if you look at the rewards that are offered to us, we get the benefit again. Because Jesus Christ and His sacrifice have offered us a greater reward than the Israelites could ever have imagined. Here in this life today, we know exactly what we have to do to obtain total and complete forgiveness of our sins, which is something the Israelites didn't have access to. We can offer up words to God ourselves through prayer, through the mediator, Jesus Christ, and the Israelites couldn't do that. We can obtain eternal life here under this new covenant if we just follow a few simple commandments. We've got less asked of us. We've got more offered to us. And yet, we let the few responsibilities that we have fall by the wayside. That's tough. That's tough. As a Christian, it's one of our main jobs to spread His gospel. Amen to evangelize our communities, to evangelize the world, to go out into the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell people what they have to do to be acceptable to God. That's one of our main jobs as a Christian. Do we obey this command? Or do we sometimes, or maybe most of the time, or maybe even all the time, let this responsibility just kind of fall off our radar? one of the few responsibilities that we have, do we let it just slide by? Maybe we don't evangelize too much because we don't really have a good grasp on why we need to be doing it. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. If there was a title to this sermon, it would be, Why Should I Evangelize? We're going to ask that question. We're going to try to answer it with a few different answers. And we're going to try to keep Bible answers in our discussion and in our study. We're going to see why we should evangelize, and we're going to go to this book to try to answer that question. Now, before we begin, I want to tell a little personal story that will have a point in a minute. Uh, I thought about this while we were talking about work during class this morning, and it involves my parents, so I'm glad they're here. When I was a little guy, four, five, six, I don't know, you'll have to ask them, uh, but I had a list of chores. And they every time, every morning I got up, there was a list of chores written in marker on a little marker board on the refrigerator. And of course these chores were, you know, correspondingly easy for somebody of that age, okay? It would be clean up your room or pick up your dirty clothes or put your toys away or something like this. So there were different jobs on this depending on what day it was and and what needed to be done around the house, but there was one job on that list that was always there. There was one job that was on that list that was there every single day. So I got pretty used to this job. I got pretty used to doing this job. And we live over in Northport, Alabama. There's a lot of pine trees in our backyard where we were. What do pine trees produce? Pine cones. Pine cones, they fall off the trees, they land in the ground, and they just covered the yard. Okay, We had a bunch of pine trees, and we had a bunch of pine cones. Okay, So the one job that was always on that list for me to do was pick up 25 pine cones. That lid, that job was there. If my mom or dad whispered in my ear as we walked out the door right here, pick up 25 pine cones, I'd be outside with a couple in my hands before I really knew what was going on. 
Right? I've heard them tell me to pick up 25 pine cones so many times in my life. Okay? That was just a job that I did. It was something that, that was required of me to help me learn responsibility and, and this and that. But I'll tell you something, as many times as I ever did that job, I'll tell you something that I never did. I never walked up to either mom or dad and asked them, why do I have to do this? And my physical well-being appreciates that. (laughs) But I don't think, they they may can correct me on this, but I don't think I ever asked them the question, why should I do this? Why do I need to go outside and pick up 25 pine cones? Because as a little guy, five years old, when your dad tells you to do something, that's really all you need to know. Dad told you to do it, you go do it. Amen. Right? And if I were to have asked him that, okay, not, to, not to mention the physical harm that would befall me if I did that, but if I were to ask him that question, what would he say? Because I said so. I heard it over here. Because I said so. That would have been the answer, right? And that's perfectly fine for a five-year-old because my dad had that authority, he still has that authority over me. If he wants to tell me to do something, I go do it because he told me to. Because he said so, right? So why should I evangelize? Because God said so. That's point number one. God told us to do it. Before we go any further, we need to understand that we don't really even have the authority to ask this question. Why should I evangelize? God told us to do it. If God tells me to go evangelize His world or pick up 25 pine cones or do anything, or if He tells me to go jump, my question is not, why should I jump? My question should be, when and where and how high do you want me to go, sir? Amen. That's the answer Amen. that we give. That's our response. Point number one, why should I evangelize? Because it's a commandment of God. And near the end of Jesus' time here on earth, Christ was giving His final instructions to the eleven remaining disciples. And this is one of my favorite passages, Matthew 28. Beginning in verse 18, it says, that Jesus came and said to them, those eleven disciples, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And we talked about this the last time I was here. It's one of my favorite passages. I love talking about it. We talked about it last time when we kind of discussed how there's four components of this. We go and we make disciples and we baptize those disciples and we teach them how to live as Christians. Those are the four components of what God told the disciples and thus us to do under this new law. There's four components of that, but I want us to think about it a little differently today. That's kind of a a, a low level thinking about what he's telling us. Let's back up and look at it at a high level. I watched a movie yesterday, and uh, it's a very popular movie. It came out a few years ago, and I'm not here to approve or disapprove of this movie, but it's a depiction of the last 12 hours of Jesus' life. It's called The Passion of the Christ. I'm not here to discuss you know, whether you should or should not watch that movie, but I watched it yesterday. And it's, sometimes it's good to see what we read. Sometimes it's good to see that. And as I was sitting down last night kind of studying this, I, I, of course my mind drifted back to Jesus Christ and what He did for us. Amen. So if you're sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and He tells you to go out into the world and preach and teach, make disciples and teach them how to be Christians and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, if, if those words are coming out of Jesus in the flesh, His mouth, and you hear it, That's one thing. I mean, that that would be powerful. But how much more powerful would it be if He's saying this to you, and the eleven disciples here, if He's saying this to you, and you just saw what He went through. You just saw the beating, and the humiliation, and the scourging, and the crucifixion that our Lord went through. And then you see Him come up to you and tell you, go out into the world and make disciples. Baptizing them. Teaching them to observe everything that I command. 
What if those words were coming out of his mouth and you knew what he just did? Jesus is telling us to evangelize here, but what he's really telling them is don't let this sacrifice be forgotten. Amen. That's right. You go out into the world and you tell people what I just did. You tell people the opportunity that I have given them and you don't let it pass by. Amen. That's why we evangelize. Because Jesus made that sacrifice for us. Reason number one, it's a commandment of God and He earned the right to tell us that. Reason number two. Why should I evangelize? I might be someone's only chance to hear the gospel. I might be someone's only chance to hear the truth. Okay, and that's easier for us to see in other parts of the world. Maybe a, a third world country. You know, it's kind of a secluded and, and off from normal society. Maybe you go to the jungles of Africa and you find a little a tribe or a village and these people don't have really access to the outside world, maybe it's easy for us to see at that point, okay, God put me here in this situation, and I'm the only way these people are going to know about Jesus Christ. It's easy for us to see that, but it's a little more difficult for us to see it here in Mississippi. In East Mississippi, right in the middle of what we call the Bible Belt, right? Everybody has heard of Jesus Christ. And everybody has a certain belief, whether it's good or bad, about Jesus Christ. Everybody knows about Jesus here. Okay? But the sad truth about it is, most people in the Bible Belt, I would venture to say most, don't know the truth. But they think they do. And that's what makes it more dangerous. We know the truth because we can read it right here. Right? Someone, at some point opened our eyes to the truth and we found out what it was. And it's our responsibility to go out and push that truth into the world. There might be someone who doesn't have anybody else in their life besides you that knows the truth. And if you don't tell them the truth, they're not going to hear it. What a responsibility that is for us. We talked about responsibility in class this morning. What a responsibility that is. To know that in your circle of influence, I can almost guarantee there's somebody that needs to hear the truth and they need to hear it from you. All of us have that circle of influence. Every single one of us. You've heard the old saying that says you may be the only true Christian that somebody knows and that's all too often very, very true. We've all got a circle of influence. We've all got opportunities presented to us every single day of somebody that needs to hear the truth And it's our responsibility and it's our job to make sure that they hear it. And you can't gloss over it and not look for these opportunities because they'll pass you right by. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is telling the Corinthians and he's telling us today, he's telling those people about living with maybe a spouse that is unbelieving. Maybe a husband or a wife who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and doesn't believe the truth. And what does he tell them to do? We won't go there for sake of time. But he tells them, don't give up on them. You keep doing the things that you need to do. You keep living the life that you're supposed to live. And what does he say might be the byproduct? They might be won over because of it. We can't look these opportunities by. We can't let them pass by us without realizing that it may be our responsibility that God has placed in our life and we're the only ones that can reach that person. Amen. We've got to make sure we keep that in the forefront of our minds. Why should we evangelize? Because it's a commandment of God. God earned that right. And because you may be someone's only chance to hear it. Number three, why should I evangelize? Because it strengthens my faith when I do it. The beneficiary of evangelism is not always the person that's being taught. Sometimes it can help us too. Right? I don't know how many educators we actually have in here. I know we have two because they came with me. But there may be some other ones okay, in here that have taught at some level before. Okay, So I want you to think back, whatever you happen to, if you teach math or you teach English or whatever you teach, I want you to think back to the very first day you taught that. The very first day you taught it, 
And I want you to then think about the last time that you've done it. Maybe it was Friday. Maybe it was a few years ago. Whatever it was, the last time you taught it. I want you to think about how different those two days went. That first day that you taught it, it was pretty difficult, wasn't it? You knew the material. You knew what you were talking about. But it was difficult to teach somebody else that. You might have gotten asked a question or two that you didn't know the answer to. It kind of stumped you. You had to go find the answer and then bring it back the next day. It didn't go as smoothly as you really wanted it to, I would be willing to bet. Mm -hmm. But the last day that you taught it, if you taught it for any length of time, it went a lot smoother, didn't it? You were ready for those questions that somebody asked you. You were ready for the, the, the problems that they would have in trying to understand and learn this material you grew between that time because you were teaching somebody else. Why should we evangelize? Because it can help us to better understand what we're believing. Sometimes teaching somebody something can help us more than it will help them. James chapter 2 and verse 26 says, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And he tells us here in chapter 2 that works are a natural byproduct of true faith. And if we go out and we believe in Jesus Christ and we tell somebody else about Jesus Christ and why we believe in Him, we're going to believe it even more. Because it will strengthen our faith. Why should I evangelize? We talked about three answers. It's a commandment of God. We might be someone's only chance. And it will strengthen our faith as well as theirs. Three things that we can do. I'm not done. We're going to kind of flip it and look at this idea from the other side of the coin, if you will. We talked about why should I evangelize. We're going to look at it from the other side. Now we're going to talk about some answers to the question, why don't I evangelize? We know we should. We know why. So why don't we? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Why don't we evangelize? There's a lot of answers to this question. There's a lot of things that we can, excuses that we can make to ourselves and to other people, and there's probably a lot of excuses that we've personally made throughout our life. So we can't talk about every single one of those. I'm going to talk about just a few that I think are probably real popular, some that have affected me in my life. Why don't I evangelize? The most common question, that we, the common response that we hear to this, I'm not ready for that. I don't know enough at this point in my life. We're going to combine those two and talk about them at the same time. I don't know enough to teach somebody else the gospel because I might mess it up. Amen. That's a popular response, isn't it? The question that we need to answer is not, is this argument made? Because we know it is. The question that we need to answer is, is this argument really even valid? Does this argument make sense? Does it make good sense to make this argument to somebody else? I want you to, if you have a Bible, I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 8. We're going to read a section of Scripture here. Acts chapter 8. We don't have time to read the whole thing, but we will pick up in verse 30. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 30. It says, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And now the passage of the Scripture that he was reading went like this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Let's stop there. This is a great example of conversion. If you're ever talking to somebody, they want to see an example of true biblical conversion, take them to Acts 8. Does it get any better than this? Philip is given an opportunity with this Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch is ready and willing to learn about Jesus. He has a specific question he wants to ask. And Philip is right there and he pounces on the opportunity. Because the Holy Spirit led him there. The eunuch starts with a prophecy that he doesn't quite understand. 
And so he asked Philip about it. Well, who is he talking about here? And quite obviously, he's talking about Jesus. So Philip says, this is Jesus Christ. This is who He was. This is what He did. This is why He did it. And this is what you've got to do to come into contact with that sacrifice and accept that free gift that He's offering. That's all He said. That's all we're told that He said. This is Jesus. This is who He was. This is what He did. And this is what you've got to do now. That's all He said. Now, who in here can't answer those four questions? Who in here can't tell somebody who Jesus Christ is? Amen. And what He did. The sacrifice that He went through and the sacrifice that He made and why He made it to offer us the opportunity that we might not have to pay the price for the horrible things that we do. And who in here can't tell them what they've got to do to accept it? And what they've got to do the baptism that they have to undergo to come into contact with that blood yes, sir. to accept that forgiveness. Amen. If you're here and you're in this room, you were once baptized, you can answer those questions. Amen. That's all Philip did. Amen. That's all Philip did in one of the best examples of conversion that we can have in the Bible. That's all he did. That's evangelism. You can talk to somebody about that. So if you've ever made this excuse, and I've made the excuse myself, if you've ever made this excuse in your life, I'm not ready, I don't know enough to teach somebody else, I want you to make a commitment to yourself. Not to me, not to the person sitting next to you. Make a commitment to yourself right now that over the next seven days, you're just going to have a conversation with somebody about Jesus. It doesn't have to be about anything that you disagree on. It doesn't have to be about anything. Really, just, just go have a conversation about Jesus Christ. We went to church Sunday morning and we were talking about Jesus and the sacrifice that He made. You know about the sacrifice? Yeah, well, I, know about, I know about what He did. Wasn't that great? Wasn't it great what He did? Have that conversation with somebody that you've never had it with before and you know needs the truth. Amen. Just go have that conversation. Amen. That'd be easy. That's an easy step. And then the next week, over the next seven days, you go have a conversation and you have a conversation with somebody that's got a question for you. You talk to them. You tell them about the church of Christ. You tell them about what Jesus did and you talk to them until they ask you a question and answer it. Amen. Answer that question. Amen. Take it one step at a time. If you've ever made this excuse, I'm not ready, I'm here to tell you and everybody else is too, you are. Amen. You are ready. Amen. And God needs you to be ready. <laughs> Why don't I evangelize? I'm just not ready. Another good, or I say good, another popular and common response to this is I don't have my own life in good enough shape to do that right now. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to do that, not because I don't know enough, but because I got my own things I got to figure out first. That's a popular response. It's one, again, that I have made in my life before. I've got things in my life that I've got to get fixed before I go tell somebody else. And why? Because I'm not going to go enough person for anybody to listen to me. If I go try to tell somebody about Jesus and about what He did and about how you're supposed to live, they're going to laugh in my face because they know how I live. Have you ever made that excuse? Maybe verbally or, or not so. Have you ever let that stop you from talking to somebody else? about Jesus. If you sometimes feel this way, know that you're not the only one. There's also going to be somebody else in this room, me if it's not somebody else, that feels that way sometimes. And if that's not enough for you, open this Bible up and find an example of somebody. It won't be hard. Find an example of somebody who lived a questionable life and then God used to further His kingdom. Amen. In Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 54, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at Him. Talking about Stephen. But He, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And He said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed at Him. And then they cast Him out of the city and they stoned Him. 
And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named who? Saul. Who was later known as Paul. The man that would later be known as Paul had more than his share of skeletons in the closet. This was just one of the many things that he could be ashamed of. Paul, just like the rest of us, have things in our past that we're ashamed to even talk about. That's right. And Paul didn't let it stop him. When Jesus found him that day on the road, Paul decided right there that he wasn't going to let his past interfere with his future. Matthew chapter 26, we won't go there for, for interest of time, but 60, verse 69 through 75, we talk about another guy, Peter. Simon Peter. You remember what he did that night? He was there in the garden. He was there in the garden with everybody when, when Jesus was arrested by those centurions and they took him off to that mock trial. He was there. He remembers that. That's right. And then he was also there during the trial when they were slapping him and spitting on him and beating him while they were, quote, trying him and judging what should happen to him. He was there. And then everybody started pointing at him and said, You know him. You're a Galilean. You were with him. I know who you are. He said, I don't know the guy. I don't even know who he is. I don't even know what's going on here. He did that three times while Jesus was right over there. And Jesus had just told him he was going to do it. Three times. You can imagine just the, the pain that was in Peter's heart when he realized what happened. You can imagine that. And you can imagine how he could have let it overcome him like his buddy Judas. He could have let it get the best of him. But he picked himself up and a few days later we see him in Acts chapter 2 doing some good things for God. That's right. Peter didn't let it stop him either. And if those two guys right there have such stuff in their past that they're ashamed of, and they're still used by the Lord, none of us can make the excuse that we're not good enough to share God's Gospel. Not one of us can say that. I'm not a good enough example. I don't know enough. And the last one, I'm going to let you out of here. This one right here is pretty common. Maybe even more common than the first one we talked about. And this one is by far and away the most dangerous. Why don't I evangelize? I will. But I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it later. Time's not right. Every one of us have made that mistake. Every one of us. That's right. I've got a lot of work to do right now. I'm just things are swamped at the office, and you know my my family. We got stuff we're going on. I just, I can't do that right now. I don't have it in me right now. It can wait. It can wait a day. Well, the time is just not right with that person. I want us to grow a little closer and have a better relationship, and then I want us to talk about this. So you just give me a week. Well, I talked to someone yesterday. That's good for my work for the week. I'll talk to this person tomorrow. I'll just do it tomorrow. C.S. Lewis once wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters. And this book was obviously a very fictional story, but it's a, a story about Satan and his imps or his demons, and they're trying to figure out what they can do to best prevent people from evangelizing and try to figure out how they can best stop somebody from preaching the gospel. Right, so it's, it's basically a book of them conversing back and forth, trying to figure out what the best plan of attack would be on the gospel and on evangelism. So he writes that Satan here is looking for a way to distract people, and different demons are kind of around him, and they're coming up with different ideas. And they, they'll shoot an idea at him, and he'll say, oh, I don't like that idea because of this. Well, I don't like that idea because of this. So somebody comes up and says, we'll, we'll just tell people that there's no hell. There's no punishment that they're going to face. And Satan says, well, now everyone knows there's a hell. There's a heaven and there's a hell and everybody knows it. That's not good. That's not a good excuse. Well, we'll just tell them that if they do go preach the gospel, nobody's ever going to listen to them. No, Satan says, I'm not good with that either. I don't like that idea. 
And then finally, this, this small demon from the back of the room has an idea and he just kind of mutters it a little bit and just, everybody, just a hush falls over the room. And Satan says, that's the one. That's the idea. And the idea that the demon had was this. We'll just tell them that there's no hurry. There's no rush. You can do it. You, you know you want to evangelize. You want to teach. That's great. You do it. But you can do it right now. You do it later. You don't want to deal with that right now. There's no hurry. Satan perks up and he says, that's, you're a genius. That's the plan we're going to roll with. And that's what they do. Well, obviously, it's a, it's a fictional story. But how true do we see that in today's world? That's what Satan attacks us with, doesn't it? That's what he most attacks us with is, we'll deal with that later. Let's work on something else right now. Evangelism is just not a pressing issue for many of us. We don't see the need to do it because we're always going to have tomorrow. What's James tell us? James tells us in James chapter 4 beginning in verse 13, he says, Come now you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such place and, and spend a year and, and trade and make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow's going to bring. That's right. What is your life? Amen. For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and we'll do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it's sin. That's what James tells us. That's what the Holy Spirit tells us in James chapter 4. We can't be arrogant enough to think that we're always going to have another opportunity because one day, we're going to be wrong. One breath that we take in at some point in our life is going to be the last one we ever breathe in. And maybe worse, I don't know if it's worse or not, but one breath that that person that needs the gospel is going to be their last one day. And then they're not going to be able to hear it from nobody. We can't let tomorrow be given to us in our minds. We're not guaranteed anything. If we're going to evangelize the world, we've got to do it now. Well, we've still got a chance. We talk about all these excuses and we talk about the reasons we should and we understand that. And we talk about all the excuses we make when we don't. None of them really matter because of the first reason we talked about. God told us to do it. God told us to do it and He more than earned His right to do that. And it's our responsibility to do it. If you're here this morning and for some reason you've never made that decision, and you, maybe you've never heard of the gospel and you want to hear more about it, you want to hear about Jesus, you want to hear about this sacrifice that He made and why He made it, and you want to hear about what you've got to do to come into contact with it and, and let it be useful in your life. You want to talk about that. Hey, dude, there's a lot of people here that would be happy to do that with you. There's a lot of people here that will be ready and willing and thrilled to do that. Maybe you've already heard about that and you're ready to make your, your final step. And you're ready to be baptized by immersion for the forgiveness of your sins. We can do that too. We can get that done this morning. But if you're here, you've done all that. You've been living the Christian life and something's gotten in the way. You've let everything just kind of coast until that ever appearing tomorrow. Let's do something about it right now. If we can help you in any way, we ask you to come. Together as we now stand and we sing. Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me.